Hi, I'm Chris Potts. This screencast is the first of three discussing our compositional semantic grammar. This screencast covers some technical preliminaries relating to functions, notation for them, how they work, and how we use them to model linguistic meaning. The second screencast introduces a semantic lexicon, and the third introduces the grammar itself. To start, let's just establish some ways of talking about functions. This is a sort of bracket notation. The inputs are on the left, the outputs are on the right, and the arrows show how the inputs and outputs are connected. Intuitively, for this domain, this could be called the child function, since the three children map to true, and the one adult maps to false. This second version is more familiar from programming. We're looking at the function called child. It has one argument, given here as x. If the argument is a member of the set of children, we return true, otherwise we return false. This third view of the child function is the one we'll work with the most. It uses some of the notation from lambda calculus to identify the function. The lambda x part says that this function is looking for a single entity argument. Once it has that argument, it behaves just like the others, returning t or true if the argument is in the set of children, otherwise f, that is false. It's really useful in thinking about our grammar to be able to relate sets to functions in systematic ways. The notion of a characteristic set gets us from functions to sets. So here we have a function mapping Maggie, Lisa, and Homer to true, and Bart to false. To create the characteristic set, we identify the arguments that map to true for the function, and simply assemble the corresponding entities into a set. They don't actually leave the function, of course, so let's put them back. Uh, this gives us the characteristic set of the function we began with. We can go in the reverse direction as well. That's what the notion of a characteristic function gives us. To do this, though, we need to know what the universe is. More precisely, what the domain of the function is. So for this example, let's assume that the domain is this set U of Simpsons. We start with this set containing just Lisa, Bart, and Maggie. To create the characteristic function, we map all those entities to true. And here's where we need to know the domain of the function. For all the entities in the domain that aren't in the original set, here just Homer, we need to map them to false to complete the function. This finally gives us the full characteristic function of the set we began with. And of course, this is the characteristic set of the function we created, so we have a correspondence in both directions. A word of caution is in order here. It's important to do these conversions absolutely mindlessly. The biggest gotcha is that people mess around with the inputs and outputs. For instance, suppose we start with this function. It happens to have sets and entities in its domain, as you can see here. So when you go to create the characteristic set, you need to just collect the inputs that map to t and put them into a set like this. What you absolutely do not want to do is reach inside the inputs to create this set. This is not the characteristic set of the original function. The original function doesn't even have a or b in its domain. You'll avoid this mistake if you think very mechanically about the inputs. Okay, our final technical preliminary is function application. This is where we actually start to, to perform computations with our functions. Let's start with this function. I guess it could be called the goes to school function for our small domain since it maps Lisa and Bart to true and Maggie and Homer to false. The notation for function application puts the argument, here Maggie, in parentheses to the right. To figure out what this expression picks out, we intuitively look up Maggie in the domain, find that she maps to the false value, and that tells us what the final meaning of the expression is. Or, from another perspective, we applied the function to the argument Maggie to obtain the value f, or false. Using the programming style notation, here's the child function we saw before, and if we apply the function to Homer, we get something that evaluates to the expression f. The concepts are the same when we use lambda expressions. Here's the child function given as a lambda expression, now with Lisa as the argument in blue parentheses at the right. To calculate the value, we get rid of the outer lambda x, since we are filling that argument slot. I like to imagine the argument Lisa crashing through and destroying it. And then we substitute Lisa wherever there was an x uh, variable in the body of the expression. 
Now we're essentially just evaluating this assertion of set membership. Since Lisa is in the set, we get the value t in the end. Here's a summary of the entire computation we just discussed. With these concepts established, we're now well positioned to define our semantic lexicon and build an effective semantic grammar.